right. So I'm Carson. I didn't formally introduce myself. Uh, I work here with Marius, and um, I'm interested in how visual cortex also integrates behavior with visual processing. And um, <clears throat> sorry, I think you'll see in this talk that if you want to integrate behavior with imaging, you really need to do good motion correction because if your sample is moving while it's behaving, then you can have a lot of confounds. So we'll go through that in this talk here. So here's an example of an uncorrected uh, field of view that we'll be processing uh, this afternoon. And you'll see how we can motion correct it and get rid of both rigid movements and also non-rigid movements where different parts of the plane move in different directions. So why should we care? I already mentioned the first part, that behaviors cause brain movements. So that's a big problem. Um, so some movements are easy to spot, like movements in XY you could see in that video, pretty easily you can tell when the plane is moving in XY. But if the brain is moving up and down, some people are really good at spotting that, but it's not, it's not very easy to spot it, and not in all recordings can you see if the brain is moving up and down. And that can cause a lot of compounds too in your recordings. Um, so first we'll go through correcting XY movement, and then we'll talk about ways to correct for Z movement, primarily online Z correction while you're doing imaging. So for XY registration, um, the first thing we need to do is we need a reference image to align all of our frames to in our movie. So we need, we need an image that's going to be our target to which every frame will be aligned to and shifted to. The next thing we do is we compute the shifts relative to this reference image for all images across, across time. Then we compute, um, this is an option, uh, but I highly recommend that you do it for, for all of your recordings, is to compute non-rigid shifts. So that's basically we divide the field of view up into blocks, and then you register each of those blocks separately to the, to the uh, reference image. And then finally, we'll talk about benchmarking results. And this is primarily done inside the GUI. We have some uh, nice tools you can use inside the GUI to benchmark how well your registration did. So first, we're going to compute the reference image. Um, so, so maybe this is something you've done in the past as well. It's something you can, that's commonly done is you just take the average of maybe 250 frames and you use this as your reference image. Can anyone tell me why you might not want to just use the average of frames as a reference image? We won't be able to correct for Z shift, so. Hold on to that, but but does anyone have a another idea? So things will get exactly yeah. So if you just take the average of frames, then your your reference image is going to be a bit blurry, and that's really problematic because you want to have something crisp to align the edges of your cells to across the the uh, the plates in time, um, or it could be any kind of it could be a dendrite or boutons or anything like that. So what we do instead is we take we do take 250 random frames, and then we compute the correlation matrix of these 250 frames. So we correlate each frame with, with one another. So we're going to have a correlation matrix that's 250 by 250. And then we take the, the frames that are most correlated with, with maybe 20 other frames in that field of view. So we take the top 20 most correlated frames, and we take the average of those. So we're hoping that these frames that are very correlated are, are not shifted from each other in x, y. So we kind of take that as the base of our seed, and we take that as our initial seed. And then we, and then we take those tw those, the average of those 20 frames, and we, and, we start, um, and we start aligning the other 250 frames to them iteratively. And we keep correcting and remaking the reference image over and over again, and we keep aligning to it. Um, and then that gives us something that's much crisper. So this is the iteratively aligned version of the reference image. Does that make sense? So now you have something with, with much crisper edges that you can align to. Can I Yeah. So if you change the 250 frames to all the frames you have in your image, then your reference image becomes the mean motion corrected image. Yes, but this would be a really slow way to do that. So we, you don't want to do it that way because you don't want to do this iterative step because we're doing multiple passes through these 250 frames to get the most aligned version of them. So in theory, yes, you could do that, but you probably, you only want to take one pass through your data for the rigid registration, if that makes sense. And this would be many passes. With your reference image, might potentially be better that way, right? If, if you use more frames. Yeah, and that's actually an option is, uh, it's like NIMG init. In the pipeline, you can use more frames. Um, but 
usually after around 500, you're not going to see that much of an improvement. It really depends on your recording. But if you need a lot more frames for your reference image, I would start to get a little worried about your recording, I think. Um, that maybe you have Z drift or something like that. Or it could be sparse labeling too. There's a, but yeah. All right, so for rigid registration, we have a reference image now. And now here's an example of a single frame. And then here's the difference between those two frames on the left or on the right, sorry. Here, let me put up, put up my pointer. So here's the difference image. And you can see in the difference image, so red is, is like the positive difference, blue is a negative difference. So you can see this cell is shifted in, the, in, the, in this frame. Sorry, this should be example frame, not a line frame. So you can see this frame is shifted uh, from the reference image. So does anyone have any idea how you might compute the, the shift here to, to compute the shift back to the original, the reference image? Yeah, so that's one step. One step ahead. First, we'll do the cross. I'll tell you about the cross correlation. So that's um, so the cross correlation is just the correlation at every single pixel shift with the image. So first, so you so you move the frame around around the target, and at every x y shift, you compute the correlation with that. Does that make sense? And then you get something that looks like this. And so now you have a peak that's at four, uh, four, one away from the center. And that's sort of, you can kind of see the shift is, is around four pixels. Uh, so we use cross correlation. We specifically use phase correlation, which I'll get into in a second, but um, in Sweet 2P. But if you just do cross correlation in this way, it's quite slow. You can think I'm doing a loop, right, where I move my frame over the, over the target image. That's, that's pretty slow. Uh, but we can take advantage of the convolution theorem, which says that the cross correlation is equivalent to multiplication in the Fourier domain. So, so the the uh, the frequency domain, basically the Fourier domain, is you're representing each of your each of your time domain signals, or in this case, this frame. You're you're uh, you're representing it as a function of its uh, its primary frequencies. So, like if an image has a lot of really sharp edges, you're going to have a lot of high frequencies versus low frequencies. Um, and you can do, you can think of this uh, convolution as a multiplication in this frequency domain where you're representing the image as a bunch of different frequencies rather than taking this image and moving it in a loop. Should I write down the convolution theorem? Or you think? Uh, I think this is the kind of thing where it's good that you guys get a sense of how it works without like deeply understanding the math because that requires but just understand, you know, that this is something we use to speed up registration, so that if you write a quiz, you know that. But you know, the way it works, it would, it would be even hard for us to like actually prove this on the board, right? Because it's, it's kind of one of those things you learn about it once, and then you kind of rely on it. So maybe let's let's keep it. Let's try to get a sense of, you know, what is the stuff that is really useful for you to understand deeply. So maybe Carson can mention it when he gets to it. And then what is the stuff that, you know, here I'm gonna flashes so you get a sense of you know, how it works, but really it's too much math for you know, this short version. Okay. But do I understand correctly that this phase correlation also allows you to specifically use the high frequency content? Yeah. So, so it's not only faster but better. Also. Yeah, so we'll do phase correlation next. So cross correlation just says we're gonna take the FFTs and if we're gonna do this, that's a great point. So we're going to we've already taken the FFT of each of our frames and our target image. Um, and something we might want to do is actually whiten the images, which if we're already, so here's the example of the reference image whitened and the frame whitened. So we've, we put things into the frequency domain. It's very easy to whiten them once they're there. And if you whiten them, then you get images that look like these two images here. And the advantage of whitening is exactly this, that you're getting the edges uh, of things rather than these blobby cells. And so now this is what your difference image looks like. So if you're off by a little bit, you're going to have have much bigger changes in your correlation than if you have this big blob of a cell that kind of moves slowly, that changes slowly in uh, in pixel space. Whitening is, is a fancy term for high pass filtering, right? It's just it's a particular high pass filter, but it's really mostly high pass filtering to emphasize edges and, and sharp things. 
Yeah, you're basically flattening your frequency spectrum, and in most images, your frequency spectrum has more low frequencies than high frequencies. So if you flatten things when you whiten, you're accentuating these high frequencies. And so this is, the, this, is this difference between cross-correlation, where you have this, this peak in the cross-correlation between these two frames that kind of falls off slowly. It's going to fall off with basically the diameter of your cell. Whereas in phase correlation, you have the edges of the cell that you're using, and so it's going to fall up much more quickly because once your edges are misaligned, you're going to quickly fall off, and that's this correlation map here. Does that, does that make sense? Okay, so with rigid registration, we just move, we compute the phase correlation um, in integer shifts like this, and then we just move the frame in integer shifts. Just We use the function mp roll. You can use any function just to shift things around. So that's the end of rigid registration. So now you all know how to rigid register your movies. So now the next step, so this is, in the pipeline, this is the way we do it too. First we rigid register uh, the frames, and then we go back and we do non-rigid registration, where we divide the field of view into blocks, into overlapping squares, and we try to align each block to the corresponding block in the target image. So it's good to, if we do rigid registration first, hopefully we've gotten rid of uh, some large shifts and then this will be easier to do. Um, and you can think, uh, you want to divide it into a lot of blocks if you want to have high accuracy, but there's kind of a trade-off. If you divide into too many blocks, you won't have enough signal left to do your uh, alignment. So uh, that's another parameter you can play with is the block size that in, the, in the pipeline. So we compute the phase correlation between each block and the corresponding block in the reference image. And so that's going to give us these little peaks. Um, this is on a smaller scale of, of 7 pixels, so they look a bit broader. But um, these are the phase correlations of each of these blocks with the reference image. And then each of these corresponds to a shift. So now we have a shift for each of these blocks. Um, but what we really want is a shift for each of the pixels. So maybe some people know what we're going to do next. What would you do to get a shift for every pixel if you have something like this? Interpolate. So we're going to do we're going to do bilinear interpolation um, to compute the the phase correlation not just of each of each block but of each pixel. So that say you've got a pixel in between these two, it's probably going to look the same as one of these shifts. But if you have a pixel in between maybe these two blocks, you're going to have some average of, of these things, basically. You're taking the average of, of uh, the two, basically your nearest neighbors of, of the blocks that you're close to and, and weighting them. If you're closer to the center of one block, you're going to have more shifts like that block versus if you're further away, you're going to have more shifts like the other block. So, so back, yeah, sorry. Um, they should be. So what do we think happened in that point of error where arrows start going in all sorts of ways? Like, do we really believe that the tissue changed in that way? At that point? Or what's, a, what's maybe a better hypothesis there? Is that good? Maybe, but it kind of looks like the errors are too big. Z-drift would mostly stay in the same place in X, Y, right? Um, so that will be kind of like, like Z drift, right? I think a better hypothesis here is that probably that air is just really dark and noisy, right? And it really, we are not estimating very good arrows there. And so the step that I think, I don't know if Carson can tell you about, there's also some smoothing happening in areas that are really dark where we are unconfident about the magnitude of the shift. We actually kind of average over a bigger area and look over where there's more signal. Yeah, no, no, that's a good point. Yeah, I wasn't going to bring it up, but um, so you look at the, so we're looking at these phase correlations, and some of these you can see are brighter than others, and they're all on the same scale, and um, we actually compute the SNR based on these phase correlations. So how how big is this peak relative to the surrounding um, the surrounding pixels of phase correlation? So if it's not that peaky, if we just see if we don't see a large peak, then we're going to weight that blocks. Uh, shifts less, and we're going to when we smooth over it, it's going to be weighted less in our in our smoothing function. So basically, the shifts the shifts in this corner will not be as large as the shifts in in other places. And in this case, I might have actually this might be 
the I think this this actually is with the reweighting here using the SNR. So you can see in this corner these shifts are actually pretty small. And then the shifts over here are much bigger. Thanks for bringing that up, Marius. So, okay, I'm a little lost. Can you just, this is not the whole image, or uh, this is, okay. This is one image, though. One this is image, one, frame. one frame. Yeah, so we do this for every single frame in the recording separately. Every frame is, d is done, I mean, we do it in blocks, but so independently. How does this relate to, in the, in the, in the switch to P, right? You say 128 times 128 is your block. Yeah. So, but I see, like, I don't know. It's not the same size of blocks, right? Or I don't know how this relates now to this number. It is actually, but we make them quite. Uh, we make them very overlapping, okay. because we want to be able to average. We want to be able to average. For instance, if there's dim areas, we want to be able to have some overlapping pixels to use to estimate. Because so you. Each of the error corresponds to one of these blocks. Now. One of these. But because there are many more, because there's so overlap. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So you don't want to, we do want to have a lot of blocks because we want to be able to move in many different, it potentially in many different directions, but then we don't want them to be too small because the SNR will be low. So yeah, each of these, yeah, thank you for bringing that up, is 128 by 128. Okay. And then we upsample, and then this is each of the pixels, uh, shifts. But you interpolate between blocks right. together to the pixel level. And there will be already, like, there will be some correlation between these because they're using the same pixels. Right. Okay. Um, and that's something we want. So that is something we, we have tried not having them overlapping, and so it does make the do as well. Smaller, um, then the overlap will be smaller between the blocks, or, or it's just getting Yeah, it, or? it will get smaller. I think, it's, I think it's a function of the size of the block, but we can look into the code and document that. <laughs> does we save these? Shift maps. Um, it it does save the shifts for every single block, but not for every single pixel. So going back to the uh, blocky errors in the corner, if there are all uh, blocks in the corner, and they're all correlated with each other because they're overlapping, doesn't that become a bigger problem then? Because does it just mean there's no correlation between the overlapping? Well, in this, in this case, uh, I think it's like what Marius was saying. There's not a lot of SNR there. So it's, it's pretty noisy, even though there's some pixels that are overlapping. They're not, um, they're, there's just a lot of noise in that region. So it's still able to get different shifts, even though they have some overlapping pixels. Because some of these, I mean, for instance, this one on the edge might just not have any features that can be used. And this one does have some overlapping pixels with it, but it has maybe a cell or something in that field of view that it's able to use to do the alignment. Okay. So we non-rigid register. This is what the image looks like. Um, we're not seeing any shifts on this cell, which is good. We were hoping the cell wouldn't move because we, we did this uh, non-rigid registration. Um, and it's much easier to see these shifts in the GUI, so we'll talk about that later, about non-rigid registration and what these things look like. Um, it's harder to see statically, but. Um, next, we're gonna talk about, uh, we'll talk about how to benchmark things. And like I was saying, like with a single frame, it's hard to tell the kind of errors that you're getting. So the type of benchmarking we do is we actually take the principal components of the whole movie, and we see if these principal components correspond to motion or not. So let's think you have a, a long movie of your calcium imaging data, and you take its principal components. You would hope that the principal components correspond to the activity in the field of view. But if there's motion going on, then these principal components might not actually correspond to activity. They might correspond to movements or, or drift and these other sorts of things. So that's kind of, um, so that's why we take these principal components of, we're taking the principal components of the raw pixel space. And in that case, we could see maybe it is there is motion, or hopefully these are just corresponding to different um, activity patterns. So I don't know if I should go into the math now, or just keep. We'll talk about this again later when we when we uh, look at this inside the GUI. But basically, each of these principal each of these is the principal component uh, uh, of the of the pixels across time. And so this is its trace across time in this upper right corner. 
So this is how this principal component changes. And then we take, basically, when this principal component is really high, these frames here, like these times here, and then when it's very low, so like these times here and here and here, we take the average of those times, and we're making, we're going to, we're going to make images from those times. So when the PC is very high, so maybe uh, it, then we'll have an image of when the PC is high, and then if, when the PC is low, we'll have an image of when the PC is low. And if this is just activity, hopefully PC high minus PC low just corresponds to cells turning on or off, um, which is what, what you want. But if it's not actually activity, then PC one or PC high minus PC low might look like cells shifted from each other. You might see things like Z drift and that sort of thing. So now we're going to go through what PC, like PC high minus PC low might look like for different types of shift. Um, and we'll see what those look like. And then we'll also look at them in the GUI later going forward. So here's an example of one movement that's, that's kind of common. So this is 2D motion during line scanning. So I think a lot of you here are doing 2P imaging, pretty much everyone. So you're, you're line scanning your frame. And so you're, you're line scanning at different times. So you start here, and then you line scan this part of the frame later. And while you're line scanning, the brain might have moved. So in between the middle of, of scanning, the mouse might have moved, or the animal might have moved a lot. And then you get blurring, particularly at the bottom of the frame, but not at the top. So you might see something like this in your difference image. There's movements like that. So another thing you might see, which is, which is hard to detect on a single frame, but is easier to detect with these PC high, PC lows that I was talking about, is Z-drift. So this often, what Z-drift looks like is you see cells moving in and out of the field of view. So you have, if you think of a cell as a sphere, it's going to get bigger and smaller. And you're going to see uh, differences that look kind of like this one here, like red is where it's coming in, it's getting bigger, and then maybe it's getting smaller in the middle because it's a um, because it's a donut shape. So, all right, let's think of if you think of a cell as a sphere, but it's empty in the middle, so it's got kind of this shell. If you think of a shell moving up and down, when you're at the top of the shell, you're going to get just the little dot, but then as you move into the shell, you're going to get stuff on the outside here, but not on the inside. So you're going to have kind of footprints that look like that. Does that make sense without drawing it on the board? OK. So that's kind of if you're, uh, I think in most cases, this is the kind of uh, GCAM that people are using, that it's, that it's not in the nucleus. So you see cells that look like this. All right. Um, there's also potentially Z rotation, which can be a problem too. And if in this case, if the Z rotation is actually in the plane that you're imaging, it's going to look something like this. So if, if this plane is moving up and this plane is moving down, you're going to see Z motion that looks maybe is going up in this direction and then down on the other side of the field of view. Um, but in general, this probably will mostly look like this because your, I mean, your rotation might not necessarily be in the plane of, that you're imaging. So you might see something more like a combination of this and this kind of. And then also another thing um, people uh, sometimes see, uh, they often say, uh, it could be for different reasons, but uh, that your tissue might expand or contract. And so this is kind of what your difference image would look like here. So if things are, are really getting bigger, then um, the non-rigid registration that we're doing in Sweet2P isn't going to work for that, because we're just trying to move things back. We're not actually expanding them or contracting them. Um, but if, so that could be a big problem if you actually are seeing something like this. But if things are just kind of moving apart a little bit, then you can correct for it with something like non-rigid registration. But yeah, it, it would be yeah, it would be a lot more difficult to correct for this directly. So you want to see if you are seeing this, then it is a problem, and you have to look into it and look, for instance, at the time course of it and what it looks like across time, like we were talking about in the in the registration metrics. This um, this here. So you can always look in time at how these PCs are changing. So you're not just to get the, the difference image here, which is what we were looking at. Now it's in um, white and, and black instead of red and, and blue. You can also look at how it changes in time. So you can see if the brain is just expanding over your recording, for instance, or something like that, or doing other things. Um, OK, so now we're going to uh, talk about drift in Z. 
So to compute drift in Z, you, uh, you need to have uh, a reference as well. So we have a reference for XY registration. We need a reference for Z registration. And I think a lot of you might have taken one of these before. You take a Z stack, you take a very dense sampling of your, of, your, of your sample. So you take many Z planes, maybe like two microns apart of your sample. Um, and then what you do is you take every frame in your recording. So you do this maybe at the beginning of your recording. You have this dense sampling. And then from every frame going forward in your recording, you align it to the Z stack. And by alignment, I mean take the phase correlation of this frame with every single frame in the Z stack and see uh, what this phase correlation is. So we, we move this along. We get something that looks like this. So we have the phase correlation at each of these depths. And you can see it's peaked here, which means this frame is most similar to this Z plane. So this this position is where the frame is most similar to the Z plane. And so we can take this, this position that we find. So I'm going to plot it here. Now we're going to do this for every single frame in the, in the recording. So this is just one. We'll do it for every single frame. And then we get a plot that looks like this. So now for every single time point in our recording, we've aligned the frame to the Z stack. And we get, we get a depth based on this phase correlation. Does that make sense? So, so this is Im important if you're having, uh, if, you're, if you're seeing drift like this, you might want to ask how does this relate to neural activity? Because it might be problematic with the recordings that you're doing. So if you look at the cells, um, we found that the, in this example recording, we found that the cells were correlated with the Z position. So now this is, we take um, the cells activity and we correlate it with this trace. So this is just a single trace in time. So we can correlate it with all the cells and say how correlated is each cell with this trace, just like you would do with the running trace, for instance. Um, and we'll do it with running next. So we say, all right, so this is the distribution of the cells correlation with the Z position. Um, so how, so there are some cells that are really correlated with Z position and then some that are really negatively correlated. So those, that's kind of problematic. Um, so that, that's worrisome. But then, and then also you see, okay, there's a lot of cells correlated with running. Okay, lots of people have seen that before. Um, now we want to ask if the cells correlated with running are also correlated with Z position. So if the cells that are correlated with running are also correlated with Z position, then we have a problem. If the cell is just moving up and down while the mouse is running, and that's why we have a, a running correlation, then we have this confound that every time the mouse is running, the cell is also moving up and down, so we can't really tell what's going on. Uh, this, and in this recording, this is kind of an extreme case, uh, but we found that the, the cells that were most correlated with Z position, that were changing the most in time, kind of drifting, were the most correlated with running. Um, so this is definitely a compound that you want to be aware of and be careful with in your own recordings. Um, so if we do the Z, in this case, we have, we have our ground truth Z trace, and we did, uh, we did a Z correction. Not that, that you should necessarily do this, but basically we subtracted this trace off from the baselines of each of our cells to try to correct for it. Um, and so now the cells are no longer correlated with Z because we've directly subtracted off the Z component. And then if we look at the running correlation, now the running correlation is much smaller. So there's still cells correlated with running, um, which is what we would expect. I mean, these, this has been validated by EFIS recordings too, or was first done in EFIS. They showed that running was correlated with uh, neural activity in V1. Um, so, so we do still see co running correlations, but they're not as large as if we hadn't done the Z correction. And now, um, unsurprisingly, we've gotten rid of the Z position uh, correlation, so now they're no longer correlated. So um, this is a really important compound to know about and to try to take into account in your recordings. And in particular, um, we were very worried about it and we worked with Scanovich so that now they actually have automated Z-drift correction in their pipeline. So if you use Scanimage, you should definitely update to the later versions and use this free module that they have to do Z correction. So at every, so while you're doing re your recording, um, if you remember this, uh, this trace that I showed you, this phase correlation with depth, it computes that uh, across time. Every single time point you're, you're imaging, it's going to keep recomputing this, 
this uh, curve and tell you how deep you are in your Z stack. So you first take your Z stack at the beginning of the recording and then while you're recording you're going to get this curve here. And so this curve is going to tell you should I move up or down in Z um, because my, my sample is moving up and down. And in this case, um, scan image actually is integrated with, um, in our case we're using the fast Z correction, but um, I think they are also integrated with other motors too, that it will automatically correct for you with some sort of time scale. So that you can actually, you just set up your recording, you take a Z stack at the beginning, you set this up, and then it will automatically move your, your stage or whatever needs to move to actually correct for the Z drift across time. Yeah? Um, does this depend on your field of view size? And if it is dependent, how like how dependent is it? Like, because I'm guessing like it's <coughs> depending on your field of view. How many how many pixels to represent your cell is going to be different? And I'm wondering if, <coughs> if you have like a some large enough field of view, like it might not be as big of a problem. But I, I don't know. Um, so I guess maybe I don't know the optics well enough. But if you zoom in, you're not changing your point spread yeah, function not, in Z. No, but yeah, right. So that's what matters. So it's your point spread function in Z that matters. Right. So your point spread function in Z is larger, so you are averaging over a larger space. So yeah. Z movement doesn't matter so, like it can be okay for a few micron or so. But then if you're, I think more what's important is if you're imaging small structures. So like if you're imaging boutons, like axons for instance, then you, this problem it becomes much bigger. I think it's the size of what you're imaging. Okay. Um, but maybe someone can correct me with more optic background about point spread functions, but um, yeah. I would say it's very, it's more dependent on the sample that you're looking at. If it's, if it's a smaller size, then this is much more important. I, and actually in this case, this example that I showed, um, a lot of these cells that had very large correlations with Z position were actually interneurons. So they were smaller, smaller cells too than the, than the pyramidal neurons. Do I understand correctly that that you're saying that corrections in Z you should try to do online while... Yeah, I would say because we don't really know the ground, like how do you do Z correction? Like the cell's moving, so you have a change in baseline, but you also have a change potentially in, in scaling too, with multiplication. So it become, it's not really an easy problem to solve mathematically, or there's not really a ground truth for it. So we would recommend that you do it online if you can. That's where you want to, to get to, and once you're there, the next step is to do the online correction that will help you on slow time scales, uh, not so much on fast time scales, because there's, you know, we need to integrate a bit of information before we can tell you, you know, how far up or down you are. So keep that in mind. So we can we can take consecutive steps to diminish the magnitude of the problem. I don't think you'll ever like really get rid of it. So it's good to recognize it and have a way of quantifying. But if you image like a whole a volume rather than a, than a plane, then you could do something similar as the, the X, Y drift corrections, but then in, in Z, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely you could. We don't have it implemented at right. the moment, but it is, it is an option too. But there is, there is, there, there is a trade-off um, that you're going to image much less, mu much fewer, yeah. far fewer cells than if you have a, a non-dense sample, so. Right. Um, so that's pretty much it. Uh, so I would recommend you run, you can run first without non-rigid registration, but then you can check the registration metrics and see did you really need to use non-rigid registration. It's not that much slower. We've made registration really fast now, so I would recommend using it um, no matter what, uh, but it's up to you. Um, so it works pretty well with low SNR recordings too. 
So we have the phase correlation and we also have the smoothing that Marius was talking about across blocks. So, um, so if you really do, if, so there is an example where it might not work, which is if you have really sparse labeling. And in that case, what a lot of people do is they'll, um, they'll inject TD tomato along with their sparse label. They'll have TD tomato with GCAMP together. And so like if you're imaging maybe really sparse dendrites or, or something like that, you'll have the red uh, background image. And so Sweet2P has an option that you can align to the red image. So you could use that if you have really sparse labeling, then you might get bad uh, registration with the green channel. But in most cases, if you're doing cellular labeling, um, it should work well. And if it doesn't, then maybe you need to crank up your laser power or something else. Um, so also be aware of, of different brain movements that we talked about and how they might affect neural activity. Just like do sorts of sanity checks with your data to make sure that what you're seeing is actually real. Um, and also perform online Z correction if possible, or at the very least, um, you can look at the registration metrics, and you can also take a Z stack at the beginning of your recording and do this uh, registrate, uh, do this, uh, do this alignment offline, and see how how this changes across across your recording. Um, yeah, and that's it. Thanks everyone for listening. <laughs>